Germans were arriving in Los Angeles by the 19th century, or should I specify, one German had... The one, 19th nine. century? You can do that the whole time, because yeah. I, I say 19 like a lot. <laughs> Get ready. Let's see. His name was Juan Domingo. He was the German... Wait, wait. His name was... Wa he was German, and his name was Juan, Juan Domingo. Domingo. <laughs> yeah, Juan Domingo was a German seafarer who was rescued from a ship in the sure. San Pedro Harbor and was recorded in the 1836 census. He liked San Pedro so much, he stayed there, became a prominent landowner in San Pedro. And by the 1850s, there were some pioneer business owners who hailed from Germany, as well as people who were just like bakers. Their names? <laughs> oh, Jose <laughs> Sanchez. <laughs> These old Nordic names. <laughs> Pedro Camancho. <laughs> by the 1850s they were like they owned businesses and stuff but they also they were bakers and pharmacists and brewers and barbers and butt make bo yeah, boot makers butt makers and, butt makers and uh it's <laughs> my job I make butts <laughs> uh, no if ands or butts <laughs> i make butts you're a fan of my work i make butts i, I like to make butts i cannot lie <laughs> That's Aaron Mankey doing a Laura episode on butts. That's Aaron Mix a lot. <laughs> Sir Manx a lot. I like mm, big butts. Yeah, I said, I said it. it. Big butts. <laughs> Back to Nazis, please. Oh, let's, please. Let's do this. In the developing years of the city, the German community established its own benevolent society, the Turnverin Society, which was a German language school. The what's this? Tur uh, Turnverin? I'll spell it for you if you want. That's not necessary. You don't really care. Uh, a cultural society known as the Titan... Uh, the ta the Tautonia Concordia, an agricultural colony in Orange County using the German word for home of the Anna River. It's called Anaheim. Really? Anaheim's a German word. Wow, I, I, that, that makes complete sense. Yeah, doesn't it make complete sense? Wow, that's sense? fun. I don't want to talk about Orange County Orange here. County, yeah. <laughs> it's important to remember that there are a lot of neo-Nazis in Anaheim. By 1876, the census recorded about 2,000 German folks living in L.A. County. The number declined abruptly after Franz Ferdinand was shot and World War I broke out. Mm. An odd phenomenon. Mm. So the number of German residents once again rose uh, come 1930 after the city had grown exponentially through the boom of the 1920s. In those years, 1920, let's go to Germany for a little bit. Hitler was mm. growing no. a following. <laughs> Please, no. Please, uh, keep me out of Germany for uh, <laughs> most of the 20th century. Hitler was growing a following for his political party but also in the 20s he was hiding from the police after a cheap attempt at seizing power failed the man who hit him was an american in germany wait, wait who is this who are we talking about hitler who's that <laughs> is he one of himmler's goons <laughs> you mean wilhelm's little little pet project <laughs> he'll never amount to anything him that and the beatles won't amount to anything that mustached goon <laughs> go back to art school i say that's what i always say that's what <laughs> that's, that's what the things i say yeah at that time in the 20s hitler was trying to gain power he wasn't succeeding very well he was hiding from the police the man who hit him from the police was an american in germany his name was ernest e f nine <laughs> ernest borg nine or old uh, borgie was hiding him ernest e f half stenkel Wait a minute. Where is the middle initial? Ernest E F. Oh, so E F. E -F has two middle, middle initials. initials. Yeah. His name is an Ernesty. No, it's not Ernesty. It's Ernest E F. Or F. Stenkel. Okay. F. Stenkel with All an right. H. Okay. Stop saying. Yeah, I can, I, I'm gonna keep saying it. German pride didn't go anywhere. One place where the German community could celebrate its culture in LA was on the western edge of La Crescenta Park, an area called Hindenburg Park, named after Paul von Hindenburg, mm -hmm. who served as Germany's president from the late 20s to the early 30s. Wait, what's the guy's name again? Hinkelstein. Henstenkel. You want to look at it? Maybe you can say it. Better. Maybe you know the name. Oh, it's E.F. Hofstengel. <laughs> oh, yeah, you know the guy. <laughs> you you know him, Greg. Greg, you know him. We're talking about Hindenburg Park. The grounds were acquired by the German-American League for a purpose of gathering place for the LA German people to socialize. There was a statue of Von Hindenburg at the park, which I've seen. It looks pretty creepy because it's just kind of his shoulder and his head, and his head's pretty giant. It's still there? Where's no, it there? got re removed in the 50s. Uh, we'll get to that. Um, <laughs> Why? Who won? Who, <laughs> how does the war turn out? At this park, they had dances. They served beer and sausages. It was the first place in California they had an Oktoberfest. Huh. All of California. Yeah. First I read Southern California. Then I read it was one of the first places. Then I read somewhere that it was the first place. So I'm going to go with that. Then one. I read Germany doesn't actually exist. <laughs> I heard it's just a state of mind. Hindenburg Park stands at 3901 Dunsmuir Avenue in La Crescenta. Mm -hmm. It's where Dunsmuir meets Honolulu Avenue. You mean 3901? 3901. What did I say? 3901. <laughs> This is going to go very slow. You want to just blanket? For all of you using some sort of computing. Com computing. Com computing. Are you using that old computing? <laughs> Whoever's listening to this on a computing right now, whenever we say nine, just assume it. I'm saying nine. When I wrote this, I thought I, I was dreaming. I was dreaming when I wrote this. When I wrote all this stuff about Hindenburg Park, I'm like, oh, all of this sounds innocent. As I did more research, though, this was one of the first things I wrote about was about Hindenburg Park. And then I went back. <laughs> the German American League, which bought the park and was a, supposedly a front, as was the Turveren society and the 
Antonia Concordia, and maybe even Anaheim might be a front for something darker. <laughs> I don't even know. But a lot of these things that I'm like, oh, that's really cool. They're celebrating German culture. Nope. All of it's kind of scary. Yeah. The census recorded the number of German residents in LA in 1930 at 120,000 people. So the German community is pretty vast in Los Angeles in 1930, and they had a lot of German pride. But that's a little awkward in the 30s because of what was happening in <laughs> Germany. See, by 1932, going back to Germany, okay, well, 32, we were hosting the Olympics. If you remember that episode, yeah. we got some money from the Reichstag. Reich. Reichstag, sorry. Now you got the second part wrong. Adolf Hitler became the <laughs> Chancellor of Germany Ooh. around that time. He was appointed Chancellor by Paul von Hindenburg, who was the namesake of the park, which pretty much led to Hitler's rise to power and begun, or I guess had it had already begun setting in motion the eradication of the Jewish people and anyone who did not fit whoa, into the whoa, model whoa, of whoa. the blonde hair, blue eyed area. <laughs> <laughs> this final solution of his was a crazy idea, but what was craziest is that many people, many a majority xenophobic Germans and people and fanatics went along with it. Mm. They were like, this sounds good. Let's do this. <laughs> this is great. Sign me up. I'm... <laughs> So Hitler's rising power in Germany, in America, there's professed Nazi party representatives had been coming from the Deutsche Center of the U.S. since about yeah. 1926, setting up cells in different cities throughout yeah. the country. There were several on the East Coast, some notable ones in North Carolina, Milwaukee, St. Louis, Buffalo, Oakland. It seems like the big mission at the time was to spread Nazi propaganda, obviously. German military officers were also here in the States imparting training to military groups who pledged allegiance to Germany. The second step in their organization was to divide the country into three geographic areas, which were the division of the East, cold, burr. <laughs> the division of the West, that's us. Cool. And the middle division, which is where hobbits live. <laughs> New York, middle America. Middle America. <laughs> New York seemed to be their most important cell, followed by Chicago, which claimed to be the oldest and most important Nazi center. FYI, the German-American Boon Party, which came to LA, originates from Chicago in 1933. Mm -hmm. Not every German citizen obviously supported Nazi stuff. Yeah, of course right. not. <laughs> Many were exiles of Germany. However, we're not here to talk about them. <laughs> We're here to talk about the Nazi party in Los Angeles. Now, there are a lot of different groups This is going to be a real one-sided episode. <laughs> Equal time. Equal <laughs> equal time it's uh talk it, it, it i'll talk let me say something it's weird to think that uh obviously anti-semitism and all that was a big part of the nazi party yeah. but they weren't seen as how we see them now you know they're not like the epitome of evil they weren't yeah. then how we see them now which yeah. is the worst thing that could have yeah. happened yeah. so for these things to be popping up it's not it's weird to think but it's not that weird at the time well at the time i'll get into this but us, i'll just talk about it a little bit right now it was also the depression in the 30s yeah I, and yeah. we were looking for scapegoats and of course like americans america for americans was a big thing it still kind of is sadly but like any anybody who like jewish people were accused so much of running mm, the think? show whoa, whoa what do you say <laughs> hang on i gotta run the show <laughs> <laughs> i gotta cut your mic hold on let's talk about the nazis yeah let's stop talking about the nazis let's get back to the nazis <laughs> we've given jewish people enough time already let's get back to the nazis there are a lot of different groups uh, the out there <laughs> there were the league to save america first the national copperheads the american guards the anti-communist oh, federation God. the militant christian patriots george death Ray. his name is death rage he was the what? leader of the american national confederation tried twice in 1938 with the assistance of henry allen and leslie fry there was the american leave a christian women led by francis maxi and of course let's not forget william dudley pally and Herr schmidt who ran the silver legion of the silver shirts who we covered in an episode yeah. called podcast that time forgot when they hold up in murphy's ranch in mm -hmm. months. we've covered that yes i'm mostly going to focus this time on the bigger group that aligned more closely with the nazi party it was the german american boond or the friends of new germany which was led on the west coast by yeah. Hermann schwinn so although heavily influenced by germany and the nazi party members of the boond thought of themselves as loyal patriotic americans the mm -hmm. phrase america first comes up a lot in the reading yeah. about Boone in America. Well, you see all those pictures of them with the American flag American and the flag Nazi flag. next to a swastika. Yeah. I guess that's what it's the, called. Yeah, Amer <laughs> the, the America first is the thing that comes up a lot in the reading about the Boone in America and that's the thing that the alt-right is saying now and Donald Trump. In fact, it's the name of his new security strategy. It's called America for something something. America for the new Germany. <laughs> <laughs> According to one reading, the Boone members looked up to heroes like George Washington and Abraham Lincoln and Horst Vessel, a stormtrooper and martyr of the Nazi party after he was killed in a street brawl in Germany. He is not on Mount Rushmore so stop looking. <laughs> These guys very much were about America for white Gentiles and did not like things like communism or jazz which are two of my favorite things. Uh, <laughs> my favorite uh, music is communist jazz. <laughs> Equal time for all instruments. <laughs> Every solo is the exact same uh, amount I don't know of time. if you're familiar with the Paul of Tompkins joke about jazz but everyone gets a solo. <laughs> oh are we talking about Star Wars now? Is it time? Has enough da, time da, passed? Da, 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 da. <laughs> um, like we were saying, it was a really odd time in America because the Depression had hit. Work and money was scarce. Americans were not happy about losing jobs to people that 
didn't seem like Americans to them. Think of like the Mexican Repatriation Act, which we talked about, which happened in the 30s when they sent like thousands of Mexicans back to Mexico. Some of them were citizens, like first generation uh, Americans that were sent back to Mexico, never had been there before because mm. they want to make a room this for white all sounds very people. familiar. Uh, yeah, this is uh, all scary stuff and it's all happening all the time. <laughs> it's happening again. Time is a flat circle. Um, <laughs> angry Americans found scapegoats and were in doing so in finding Time scapegoats. Is a f- flat bratwurst <laughs> i want that to make sense you know really badly but it won't <laughs> time is a flat spatzel <laughs> now it makes less sense but it could make sense in finding scapegoats people themselves leaned into extremist groups some found communism as a way to solve the problem that capitalism had made with the depression and some went into nazism as a way to deal with what they thought the problem with america was sadly i wish that was a thing of the past uh no mm. 2017 <laughs> has been a i wish more storm. people were going into communism <laughs> <laughs> it's not a bad idea that's what that bernie sanders wants so that extremism was perfectly matched with nazis roaming the country looking for followers spider and fly like that's how you get the boon in america and that's how you get in a very multicultural los angeles everyone's looking for someone to blame and suddenly nazis are like i got an idea i know who to blame so in 1930 like i mentioned there's about 120,000 germans in america but between 1919 to 1933 it was said that there was altogether 400,000 germans immigrated to the u.s so the german american boon looked appealing to first generation immigrants but also it very quickly was filled with creeps cretins and criminals and that's just how that stuff <laughs> the <worked>. ccc <laughs> yeah the ccc so in september 1933 a company of stormtroopers first organized an alley and had been working for the nazi party regularly massive amounts of propaganda literature was shipped from german vessels through san pedro where juan domingo had was rescued a, almost 100 years before that and this was shipped and distributed by the friends of new germany the boon began as the friends of new germany in chicago 1933 as i mentioned the boon was the american arm of the nazi party and it traces roots to the Suetonius society which i mentioned was one of the the first things that was being set up in Las Crescenta and the, the German culture was was part of that. The success of the Third Reich helped the acceleration of the boom's popularity. So the German American was getting more popular as the Nazi party in Germany was getting more popular. Okay, let's get to the good stuff. The boom had two goals, to establish an effective power base by Nazifying the German American mm-hmm. community and to sway American public opinion in favor of New Germany. Mm-hmm. Under the direct leadership of uh, American Führer Fritz Kuhn, K-U-H-N. I remember we talked about him. A little I think, bit, yeah. Him. Fritz Kuhn himself appointed personally by Hitler. Kuhn was to distribute propaganda throughout the nation from the Deutsch House, which I'll get to. Typical Boone literature would say stuff like, buy Gentile, employ Gentile, vote Gentile, boycott the movies. Hollywood is Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah, with... I have that same quote in mind. Let me make sure. But read I'm going to read it in an old-timey voice. Is that okay? Yeah, an old-timey German voice. Give me your best great dictator impression. Um, I ain't never seen the movie. Is this <laughs> I... how they talking at? By Gentiles. By... Hollywood, is a Sodom and... <laughs> Hollywood is a Sodom and Gomorrah where jewelry controls vice, dope and gambling. The group was ordered to organize boycotts of Jewish-run business. I have a little bit more to that quote later that you'll find... You'll find... Humorous. Find humorous. <laughs> the groups were ordered to organize boycotts of Jewish-run businesses, especially the movie industry. They were also their jobs were to slander teachers and others who supported American entry into the war. The goal Bund hoped for was to purge the United States of Jews, minorities, communists, and anyone who did not share its notion of Aryan supremacy. Big surprise. <laughs> the idea was to take the German Nazi ideology and Americanize it while chastising anybody who did not fit into that. Just give it a baseball glove. One of the first Nazi leaders, piling <laughs> with a baseball <laughs> glove on. I caught it, but also. <laughs> Thank you, Hitler, for guiding <laughs> nice me. Nice pitch, Goebbels. <laughs> One of the first Nazi leaders in L.A. was... A swing in a Jewish myth. One of the first Nazi leaders in L.A. was Robert <laughs> Frederick Pap, Pap or Pape. P-A-P-E. P-A-P-E. Okay. Pap. He was the leader of the group that was a predecessor. He was the leader of the Friends of New Germany. Pop was a captain of German army and a member of the uh, National Socialist German Workers Party, which led for the absolute power of Hitler. Their headquarters was the Alt Heilberg restaurant building, which yeah. was the former we're, mansion. We're just, we're interlocking. We're kind of, we're, this is great. <laughs> This is great. I love us. <laughs> the old Heidelberg restaurant building, which was formerly a mansion, that had been converted into a German-American community at 902 South Alvarado Street, which is near MacArthur Park, close to James M. Wood Boulevard. That was one base of theirs. The all, other was the Friends of New Germany office, 1004 West Washington Boulevard, which is close to Union Avenue. I believe it now the 10 freeway runs through it, which is also an early address of the Aryan Bookshop who was opened yeah. by two organizers of the group. Well, I, I have more details on where exactly the schematics of that place Okay, yeah, uh, thank you. I, I kind of got like cross Oh, you didn't something. read the blueprints I sent you? <laughs> uh, Greg, you're supposed to walk the beat. Did you walk the beat? <laughs> Greg, uh, I sent you the floor plan of a bookstore from 80 years ago. You didn't go over that. I sent a lift driver to your house to drive you there. You didn't get in it? <laughs> Edgar, let's go pick you up. You didn't get in Edgar's car? <laughs> Our resident Uber driver. <laughs> Ali Meekly is Uber driver. <laughs> Edgar. Edgar. Okay, so it was run by two guys, the area bookstore, Herman Schwinn, which is, like I said, the leader 
leader, uh, West Coast leader of the Bund, and Hans Diebel. Schwinn was born in Hamburg, Germany, was uh, granted U.S. citizenship. Diebel was a Gestapo agent from Berlin. These two were referred to as the Bookshop Twins. <laughs> they were a contemporary band of the Pet Shop Boys. <laughs> they didn't really have the beats down, but they ate hey, forever, you know? Uh, later, the Aryan Bookshop would move to the Deutsch House at 634 West 15th Street near Hope Street in downtown LA, which I'm sure you'll get to. Deutsch's house, of course, translates to the German House Tavern. So let's talk about the Aryan Bookshop. Yes, there was a place in Los Angeles called the Aryan Bookshop, <laughs> and you better believe it was constantly vandalized and protested really? upon. The Aryan Bookshop was offered the bi- offered the Bitcoin? biggest- Bitcoin? Yeah, you could get Bitcoin there because you can get anything because you can't trace. It's not traceable, but the numbers are growing. So we're going to look past the fact that you could buy child I bought a lot of Bitcoin and I've used it all on Aryan literature. All of that's all just going to go up in value. <laughs> the shop offered the biggest selection of anti-Jewish and anti-communist material in the country other than Ooh. Mel Gibson getting pulled over on the PCH. <laughs> Was that two episodes in a row where we yeah, make we Mel Gibson, Gibson getting pulled over? <laughs> I mean, he is a villain and he uh, is a Holocaust <laughs> denier. It fits. This is going to be the year of Gibson. <laughs> He's coming back and I'm going swinging for him because I know when it's jacuzzi time buddy okay that's a reference to his fellatio message that he left that woman you want to you want to play it you want to play it you, play it? <laughs> you want to hear my one man show of it the area bookshop distributed a vast variety of german and english language books and articles designed to go along with hitler's basic divide and rule principle which sought to create racial hatred among all classes of society and in la we have a lot uh, the area bookshop was also a meeting ground for german nazi officials sojourning in the u.s so a hundred or so people would gather in a hall for a meeting where a makeshift stage was erected with a speakers and a podium they have an open mic how many minutes can i do is it a bucket do i have to buy is some a- anti-jewish stuff just to get a, like three extra minutes it's a one armband minimum <laughs> so there was a speaker a makeshift podium beside the podium there was an american flag a, a imperial german flag and of course the nazi flag there'd be about 15 men dressed in brown shirts and were well, scattered around the hall wait, guarding wait. the meeting what what's an imperial german flag i'm guessing it's like the eagle and all that i mean like the nazi flag is not the german flag you're right but it became the german flag because not wait a minute the nazi this is flag- a question i've never considered the nazi flag is not the german flag the nazi flag is the flag of the nazi party but it became the flag flag of germany yeah during the era where the nazis controlled germany Germany. but it was not the german flag yeah you mean they don't still use the swastika (laughs) (laughs) well we gotta stick with it he made a rule he made a big freeway we gotta keep it yeah that's weird they changed the flag yeah they took over half the world i didn't i never even considered that that they changed the flag that's crazy imagine it's 2015 and they go to the olympics and they still have to carry the swastika (laughs) around listen we're real sorry what we did yeah, yeah. yes keep carrying it there was also the continental bookshop at 2509 west 7th street which is on the other side of macarthur park and that was run by fk forens this bookshop was another one of the channels of nazi printed and sold propaganda and conducted german language classes heading up the pro-nazi film effort was fk friends and he leased several theaters around la including the historic mason opera house on broadway when a judge barred theaters from playing the german film dr koch friends <laughs> tried to sue the theater owners and lost unrelated but this is funny too he had a mock impeachment trial for FDR at the Deutsch House in 1941, which raised a lot of eyebrows, and all those eyebrows were hiling Hitler. <laughs> they stuck right out. <laughs> I feel like all the people who are on the wrong side of history hold fake impeachment shows. Because they have no power, and they think that they, they have big egos and no power, <laughs> except for Hitler, who had a lot of power. <laughs> big ego and big power. <laughs> That's what happens when you're Hitler. You might be a Hitler. You might be. If you <laughs> if you got big ego and a big power to go with it. And a little am- mustache, you might be you Hitler. Might be Hitler. <laughs> I'm Aaron Mink. I'm Aaron Mink. I'm Aaron Mink. I'm Aaron Aaron Mankey, I'm and I I'm might be baby. Hitler. He, you know, he was just about to listen to us, too. He was just about to support. <laughs> this support. was the one he was going to finally get a chance. This is the one he was going to support, and he can't support us now. I... I don't like this. <laughs> I don't like to be mocked. Oh. Much like a vampire. I didn't concentrate too much on the Nazis' influence on the film industry. I have stuff on that. Okay, I have yeah. FK Ferenc who was trying to show a lot of pro-Nazi films in Hollywood. There's another guy. This guy was a little more involved. He was a German mm-hmm. counsel. Say it. His name was George, I think it's Gessling. Gessling, yeah. Gessling, yeah. who you want to talk about. I'm going to... He was sent to LA by Adolf Hitler and Joseph Goebbels in June of 1930. Goebbels? Ger- Joseph Goebbels? Oh, it's not Goebbels. It's another guy. <laughs> It's a drag queen version of Joseph Goebbels. <laughs> Joseph Goebbels. And the single task Gessling had was stopping Hollywood from making anti-Nazi films. Gessling had been despised by anti-Nazi Hollywood for decades. And as a counsel to Germany, he somehow had a powerful grip on the movie industry and had a lot of studios adhering to his guidelines. He forced multiple studios to alter their films to make Nazis seem more sympathetic. He apparently asked Warner Brothers not to use the word Jew in a movie after a compassionate speech given about a Jewish character. The weird deal with Gessling, I don't know if you'll get into this, is that many people suggest that he was actually working against the Nazis for the Italian 
battalions. Maybe. And, and what? The, mm. I read that he also helped negotiate the surrender of all German forces. That's not true, but okay. uh, we'll get into that. Okay. Well, I can't trust all my sources, and that was a book, <laughs> published book. A typical boon activity was to drop leaflets from top. I read that in a Highlights magazine, and now I just can't believe anything anymore. I stared at the tree with the pencil in it, and I got lost, and suddenly everyone, all the Nazis are helping surrender. So, okay, I don't know what year it is. <laughs> I'm pencil tree. It's always a pencil the one tree. Thing, the one reference we know about Highlights magazine <laughs> is that they always talked about Nazis and the pencil tree. And obviously, you don't know how to read Highlights. Okay, a typical boon activity was to drop leaflets leaflets from tall buildings onto the streets. This was referred to jokingly as bombing. <laughs> like a blitzkrieg of paper. In 1934, January, the society claimed more than 300 members and maintained a close tie to the silver shirts which had a head count of like 5,000 members in Southern California, but they were somehow less powerful. The Boond also had a radio station, KRKD, which broadcast a show called the German Hour, where the hosts attacked Jews and communists, oh, and which were, in their opinion, were uh, the enemies One and the of... same. Yeah, and the enemies of Germany and America with a K. KRKD <laughs> KD 1150 was broadcast out of the Spring Arcade building on downtown on 5th near Broadway. And in the 20s, that building was owned by Amy Semple McPherson. Wow. But it was eventually sold in the 30s, so she's off the hook. <laughs> the KRKD radio not in my book. She's too white to not be Nazi. <laughs> she loved all people as long as they gave a couple bucks to her. The KRKD <laughs> tower still stands, by the way, and they just had a big old deal about lighting it up again. Wait a minute. That's the one that I always think is the RKO tower. Yeah, so that not. thing was spewing Nazi filth? For an hour. <laughs> just for an hour and night. What's, the, what's the big deal? I mean, what, uh, 23 hours controlled by the Jewish community, and then you don't get to give one hour you to can't the have Germans? One hour. <laughs> and everything else is probably a Mexican or whatever. In 1933, there was two Boone synthesizers. Synthesizers? Synthesizers. Working for the LA Times. Are we talking about the Pet Shop Boys again? The Boone synthesizers? <laughs> Their other rival band. <laughs> Much more popular, but less talented. Than the Bookshop they just, Twins. They just looked better. There was two Boone sympathizers working for the LA Times who inserted anti-semitic pamphlets yeah, into the newspaper that. swastikas were flying high in parts of LA on October 20th 1935 a group of Nazis celebrated Hitler's birthday at the German house 420 bro uh, <laughs> they had a space on the airwaves to hate they January 1st <laughs> the new 420 <laughs> they blanketed the city with their BS but nowhere did they celebrate nearly as proudly as La Crescenta, <laughs> specifically on the grounds of Hindenburg Park, where German culture was to be celebrated. Of course, the park was funded by the German-American League, which may have been a front to the boond. Named after a president who made it possible for Hitler to rise above the ranks of being a thug, rallies were held there often, scaring the S-word out of everybody who lived in La Crescenta that wasn't a Nazi. Another local were hangout- there any? Are there any? I mean, <laughs> Take that then and now. And now. Another local hangout was the old Vienna restaurant at, on Sunland Boulevard. According to the book I was using for research, Wicked, Wicked Crescenta Valley by <laughs> Gary... made Wicked Croissants. Wicked Crescenta Valley by Gary Keyes and Mike Lawler. The restaurant has a legend of having secret passages used by German spies. To do what? Uh, go from place to place. Cross the street <laughs> safely. Like school children. Why risk it? Why? Yeah. You never know when the Catholic is going to be behind the wheel. Some old nun. <laughs> You never know when one of those communist mobiles is going to come <laughs> barreling through a stop sign. A bus full of communists because that's how communists do it. They take the bus. <laughs> Hindenburg Park was kind of sounds scary, not only because of the patriotic assemblies and the swastikas and the speeches held there, which often had high-ranking boomed and Nazi officials, but also there was something called Camp Sutter. Camp oh, Sutter no. was a youth camp for the Jugendstraft movement, <laughs> roughly translated to the community of youngsters, which <laughs> also sounds scary just on its own out-of-context community of youngsters. But the Jugendstraft was modeled after the Hitler Youth, so my Miners of all ages can all learn German customs and ideals and wear cool brown shirts and armbands and get all indoctrinated under the Third Reich. Have you looked at footage of Hitler and Himmler and Goebbels and thought, yeah, this is cute, but I want to see like a Muppet Babies version <laughs> of this. Jugendstaff. Jugend Jugendstaff. Jugend <laughs> Hindenburg Park had many rallies led by different speakers, people like William Dudley Pally of the Silver Shirts, General Art Smith of the Khaki Shirts, Ralph H. Major Jr. of the White Shirts. And Warren Buffett of the Hawaiian <laughs> the white Shirts. Shirt. Not very popular. Is it Warren Buffett or Jimmy Buffett? Which one is the Hawaiian shirt was. They probably both have them. It's not Warren Buffett. It's Jimmy Buffett. It was almost funny what I just said. Yeah, I, would, I was rooting for you. <laughs> they had a lot of speakers there. Milton Christian Patriots. Gottfried Carl Hein of the Oakland Boons book there. Wilbur Keegan was the attorney and general counsel for the Boon out of New York. He pleaded with the audience for unity between German and Americans to call it America to keep them out of the British war because if they get in there, oh boy, is it going to be not fun for Nazis. <laughs> the bigger and more notable German-American Boon rallies were held in 1935 and 1939. In 35, a German cruiser was in town and the crew was invited to join in on the festivities. The main attraction for the day was the speaker Fritz Kuhn, the American Führer himself, in armed
army of 2,000 of the German-American boon descended on the park swastikas flying high next to the American flag. Imagine such a time where Nazis are walking through the streets. Imagine something like, I don't know, I'm gonna throw a year at the 2017 <laughs> where they're like, hey, it's okay to come back out. Oh, speak of the 39 rally, double bill, Herman Schwinn and mm. Fritz Kuhn. It should be noted shortly after this rally that Fritz Kuhn was convicted of forgery and embezzling boon foons, which is funny. And spent... <laughs> Uh, spent you mean bun funds? Bun funds. <laughs> and spent almost four years in prison after being deported back to Germany, where he died in 1953, because these people are all- Wait a minute, he was imprisoned after he was deported? Spent almost four years in prison before being deported okay. back to Germany, and then he died in 1953, because these people are all goons and criminals. And what mortal. happened after he died, though? Was he deported again? Oh, he's, he's a vampire. He thought Sferatu. Anywho. The rally. The Boone stormtroopers filled the area in their gray and black getup. Ooh, we're talking about Star Wars again. And uniform garbs protected the stage, flanked by red banners with swastikas. You've seen this kind of thing. Then suddenly, from high above, sounds of an aircraft. A plane mm -hmm. bombed the crowd with anti-Nazi handbills that boasted the headline. Explosive <laughs> anti-Nazi. <laughs> Explosive <laughs> headlines. Wanted for kidnapping. Adolf Hitler. <laughs> indicted by world opinion for murder and kidnapping with the intent to kill. And boy, were they right. You pesky Antifa, you haven't heard the last of us. And they <laughs> went into hibernation for... 80 years. For 80 years. <laughs> and then Ray went to go find them, and then they're like, I don't want to go back there. We're sitting here on the island where Antifa was born. We have all the old ancient texts, and it's just like... 1984, and it, yeah, it couldn't happen here. We have, Many copies of those things. We have uh, all the seasons of The Twilight Zone, and a biography <laughs> on Emilio Zapata. We have a mixtape I made with really hardcore songs on it. Uh, it's just stuff that doesn't let you become fascist. And we have Woody Guthrie's guitar. <laughs> <laughs> we tried to use it to kill fascists, but it didn't really affect them that much. The 1939, the Boone achieved one of the greatest and most notable feats they held a rally at Madison Square Garden in New York and filled it with 20,000 members and how do you get 20,000 Nazis to Madison Square Garden wait I've heard this one practice <laughs> I was so mad when I found out that joke was actually Carnegie Hall but whatever how do you get to it. Madison Square Garden <laughs> Carnegie Hall. join the Rangers how do you get Madison Square Garden Carnegie Hall damn it I messed it up but then comes 1941 and what happens in December of 1941 that's the sound of Japanese bombing you know, the naval base at Pearl Harbor and then America was thrust into World War II and our tolerance for intolerance was over although come on it's us right away well I think you mentioned in the podcast episode with Silver Shirts like right away the next day after Pearl Harbor military shut down Murphy's Ranch yeah pretty quickly after that they came for the boond usually on the opposite end of the good things the House Un-American Activities Committee Huwak started strongly mm -hmm. attacking and denying any Nazi sympathetic organization the ability to operate freely during the war years in 1942 nine alley Nazis including Schwinn and Diebel the bookshop twins of that great band were convicted of violating <laughs> <laughs> they were uh, convicted of violating the Sedition Act of 1917 which made it crime for anybody to convey information intended to interfere with the U.S. Armed Forces prosecution of the war effort. Also, part of that was it was a criminal act to promote the success of the country's enemies, which being a Nazi in America did. Two years later, 1944, 34 more precious little pure blood Nazis were put on trial for treason. This is referred to as the Great Sedition Trial 1944, which put them on trial for not only the Sedition Act, but something called the Smith Act. It was a criminal offense to advocate the violent overthrow of the government or to organize or be a member of any group devoted to such advocacy. Being part of the fascist movement that was supported by German forces, yeah, it turned that was a big no-no but through a lot of mishaps on the trial and a fight for freedom of speech in favor of the nazis which uh, is happening in 2017 and the death of the judge it was declared a mistrial la crescenta once again is influenced by nazi germany when it becomes home to the first wave internment camps for japanese citizens who are detained in the latuna canyon so weird uh, yeah no la crescenta is a weird area what like get all the <laughs> nazis out let's make room for internment it's, camps it's, yeah it's like that land was something about it was begging to become germany <laughs> after the boon was seemingly dismantled they went uh, by a different name the deutsch house men a core, which translates to the German House Male Choir, which I don't know how much... <laughs> they were just a band now? Yeah, I don't know how much fake singing they did to try to pass the mustard, but I don't think it worked. They just, after that... And they do love mustard. After that, I think they went super secret. So the Boond, after all, everything said and done, they thrived from 36 to 39 and had varying reports of numbers. Some people say there was 6,000, others say it was like 500. Either way, with American pride and Nazi hate in the air, the German-American Boond was an American bunk. Uh, oh, I got him! German American bust. Oh, oh that's better. Boon, boon, boon or bust. Oh, I like that. Don't ever speak over me again. Uh, thanks. <laughs>
Maybe my favorite thing, I don't know if uh, you'll cover this or not, but the on the street enemy of the boon was the American Legion and the Elks Lodge. No, I There was a lot of street fighting in between oh the American God. Legion and the boon, which is so cool to me. I don't know why. <laughs> we can always depend on the Elks. Yeah. In the 60s, another hard hitting fascist group sprung up in Glendale, not too far from La Crescenta. Glendale was at the time known as a white man's town. It was full of affluent white or Northern European citizens and is also a very known sundown town. First of all, before we get into the Nazi party there, it was discovered that there there were swastika symbols on lampposts in Glendale that were put up in the 20s, like officially, like molded into it, not like graffiti or but vandalism. But was it like the Buddhist swastika Yes, thing? Okay. it was put up in the 20s. No one no, really noticed it until the 50s, and they're like, what's this? Uh, <laughs> but just because you didn't mean for your lamppost to support a League of Goons doesn't mean the League of Goons won't think you're giving them a nod or a wink. Just look at Papa John's. So in the 1960s, a new organization springs up, hailed from North Carolina, but found a home at 823 East Colorado Boulevard, which is a stone's throw from the auto shop that the Hillside Stranglers are killing people at. This little nondescript house, which I think is so sad to the state, was the home to the American Nazi Party run by George Lincoln Rockwell, who sounds like a president or something on the Flintstones. <laughs> Rockwell was a charming, media-savvy, pipe-smoking, racist, anti-Semitic homophobe, <laughs> and he was chump supreme in Glendale. He was a veteran of World War II, but upon his return to the civilian life, started thinking maybe he was on the wrong side of the war, and maybe the wrong side won. Of course, American Nazi Party, ANP, wanted to create a peer your white race, all that stuff, denied Holocaust, of course, played allegiance to their favorite parts of the U.S. Constitution, mainly free speech and guns, I imagine. The day that Martin Luther King marched on Washington, August 28, 1963, there was a counter-protest held by the American Nazi Party led by Rockwell, who had predicted that 10,000 people, man, 10,000 people, man, are going to show up, man, for this <laughs> anti-march. Fewer than 90 followers of Rockwell <laughs> marched that day. They were surrounded by 100 uniformed police officers, and as soon as one of the supporters opened his mouth to give a speech, he was arrested because, <laughs> because losers. So the ANP set up shop in Glendale and although it was a very white town at the time although there was peace swastikas on city property the residents immediately protested the new Nazi house of course December 4th 1964 hundreds of phone calls were made to the city offices by furious citizens of Glendale to shut this place down they demanded that the Nazis be driven out the landlord of the property that they had set up shop at he didn't know that his renters were going to start a Nazi headquarters there and he didn't like that so when he found out he shut off the electricity and refused to turn it back on this act was backed by the city by saying the house could not be used for their dual purposes of being home and headquarters so the Nazis had to be by candlelight or if their neighbors left the porch light on they can like meet around the porch light like they had no power so the city of glendale went to war with the nazis regarding permits and building codes they fought them as much as they could the second in command ralph forbes was sentenced to six months in jail for operating a meeting hall in a residential home without a special permit but sadly his sentence was overturned on appeal but they kept at it anytime the nazis were disturbing the peace or vandalizing the city jumped all over them the glendale kiwanis club promised to use any and all available resources to get the american nazi party out of town my favorite of these stories was in the glendale news press there was a Democratic dinner meeting in Studio City and these Nazi punks were protesting it and a 70 year old woman named Sadie Vice O'Sullivan walked up to some thug and said what are you doing in this crazy rig <laughs> and ripped his swastika band off his arm and threw it in his face he says what are you gonna do with this old lady shoot me who cares I carried my point she continued he was only a little guy but if he was 10 feet tall god help me I would have done the same thing after that happened the police witnessed it and called for reinforcements so 10 help <laughs> so they sent 100 old ladies they sent 100 old ladies out to him 10 10 helmeted police officers started to surround her. I hoped to protect her, but she was confused and thought that they were there to arrest her. And she's like, what's happening? Eventually, the a &P moved from Colorado Boulevard to- <laughs> She pulled out a machine gun from her purse. I'll take you all. I'll take you all. I don't care. They moved from Colorado to 420, uh, 420, <laughs> Hitler's birthday, uh, North Glendale Boulevard. And then they had to drag ass to La Crescenta, 3853 Foothill Boulevard. But they eventually exiled to El Monte, 4375 Peck Road. Rock Pecker Bog Road. Pecker Road. <laughs> get him, man. You get Oh, you get him. Yeah, I said it. I'm that guy now. But this is the this is the dirty him. podcast now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm Peckers. The Peckers. I'm the dirty boys. We're like Joe Rogan, you know, Peckers. You're like Joe Rogan and Bill Burr here. <laughs> Bring it. And Aaron Mankey. And I'm also Aaron Mankey. <laughs> Rockwell changed the name of the American Nazi Party, which doesn't have a friendly ring to it, to the National Socialist White People's Party, which <laughs> sounds worse. Boy. Rockwell was shot outside of a laundromat in Virginia in 1967 by a former uh, member of the American Nazi Party named John Patler, and he died. The American <laughs> Nazi Party and Rockwell were the subject of a documentary called The California Reich. This trend of Nazis and neo-Nazis from Rockwell's era continued to terrorize and stay in the LA area th 
through the 80s. There's Nazi propaganda found among some teens in 1987. There's also a rally of the Knights of the Green Mountains, which was an Aryan pride group, and they marched right in front of Glendale Central Library, which was so weird because I was in Glendale Central Library when I was reading that. <laughs> and I was I looked at the address, like, where was this? I'm like, oh. I looked up, it was 1987. <laughs> the Knights were squashed out. There's another group called the League of Pace Amendment Advocates. They were squashed out because, you know, being a fascist, you belong in the shadows. Last year, February 2016, there was a particularly horrible neo-Nazi KKK march in Anaheim, Pearson Park. That's Orange County, I know, but it resulted, of course. Well, that's a, that is their home base. That, yeah, that, that is a... The just, motherland. The motherland. Disneyland and Deutschland. <laughs> Two recent notes. A German heritage group, but not German hate group, called the Tricentennial Foundation funded a sign in a beautiful Germanic-looking font that said, Willkommen in Zoom, and then in English, welcome to... Hindenburg Park. Mm -hmm. It was immediately protested, <laughs> and the Jewish Federation of the Greater San Gabriel and Pomona Valley said the sign was a callback to the Nazi history in the area. It had created an unwelcome atmosphere. And keep in mind that all the sign said was "Welcome to Hindenburg Park," and they were like, "No, not again." <laughs> Hans Eberhard, chairman of the Tricentennial Foundation, was saying, "Like I was just trying to preserve history. We weren't honoring the man, just the park. But the, because of the park's history, they were like, still no.' So they took the sign down. Why honor the man? Uh, whatever. No, not honor. I didn't want to honor the man. I wanted to honor the park. Oh. And there's and mm -hmm. also like you why? know what the park's yeah, honoring, also, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's secondary honoring, but still, it's honoring. Let's just call it, well, what we just call it Washington Park. Oh, we just call it good old boy park. Let's call it Trump Park. <laughs> the other recent note, of course, is that the Nazis and the fascists are unfortunately back. This time they're calling themselves the alt-right, which they have a particularly strong internet presence. They made themselves very known as Charlottesville, North Carolina in 2017 when they protested the removal of a Robert E. Lee statue and one of the neo-Nazis drove a car into a crowd of counter-protesters and killed someone. There was an America First rally in Laguna Beach of course, in response to that, like the very next day. A big part of all the alt-right's internet presence is a neo-Nazi community and news website called The Daily Stormer, which has offices in Santa Monica, which I don't know if Ooh. it started in Santa Monica, but it has an office in Santa Monica. Ooh, so all gross. the Pepe the Frog memes and anti-diversity coming you know, out of Santa Monica. Comes out of, it festers from this site. The creator of the website is a guy named Aaron, uh, sorry, Aaron Minky. Uh, the, the creator <laughs> of the website is a guy I named knew it. Uh, Andrew Anglin. I, I knew it. His name is Andrew Anglin, who is currently on the run from the law and is being pursued for his connection to the trolling of a real estate agent who lives in Whitefish, Montana named Tanya Gersh after Gersh has urged Sherry Spencer, mother of alt-right leader Richard Spencer, to move her offices. So after that, this Anglin guy sent all these people. He suggested to his goons they threatened her and her family, which apparently, according to his his lawyers, falls under free speech. <laughs> Gersh is now suing Anglin and Anglin is claiming to, oh, I'm not a citizen of the United States. And now he's, as of 2017, is still on the run. I hope they catch him. So that's just some of the Nazi history in Los Angeles. I'm not, that's not even the KKK and neo-Nazi history. If this was any other part of California, like Orange County or Riverside or Antelope Valley or the High Desert or Central California, Northern California, it would be overwhelming, but it's LA, so it's, it's whelming. 